How many of you are familiar with OpenLDAP? Okay, a few. Um, it's an open source project. It's been around uh, 19 years now. The main, uh, the core team of the project has three full-time contributors, and there's a bunch of other community contributors. My company, Simus Corporation, was founded uh, just before the dot-coms all fell apart, <laughs> much to our dismay. Uh, all of us were working together in a large enterprise software company before we left to found Simus Corporation. I also started working on OpenLDAP at around the same time. We're pretty proud of Simus. We've been, you know, we've survived uh, what is now two financial recessions and uh, with no outside funding. So I'm one of the founders. Uh, I have three partners in Simus. I've been writing, geez, I, I first started writing code 40 years ago. And uh, I mean, I've, I've worked on all of the GNU software projects, all the GNU development tools, compiler, debugger, linker. Uh, tech info, I mean the documentation system. Um, I was one of the early members of the Free Software Foundation. And I, I do have so uh, software that's been in orbit and didn't crash. <laughs> okay, so today's talk. Um, how many of you have actually heard about LMDB before today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two of you, all right. Well, let's change that. Uh, so we'll talk about first, what is this database? Um, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about the design approach, why it, why it is the way it is. Um, I won't spend very much time on the last topic, how do you use it? Because at that point, you can just go read the documentation and, and it'll all be perfectly clear. All right. So, uh, it, it's hard to actually do an, a features at a glance slide because it, it, you know, the font size has to get really small then. But it's an uh, it's embedded key value data store built on top of a B plus tree. It's fully transactional and fully ACID compliant. Uh, it uses multi-version uh, concurrency control. Um, the data store uses a memory mapped file. The data structure is completely crash proof. You can pull the plug on a running LMDB system and you can power up again and all your data is still perfectly intact. And it has zero recovery time. Uh, the code is highly optimized and extremely compact. Uh, the, the hot code path in here is under 40 kilobytes of optimized x86 code. All right. It, it will fit completely within a CPU's level one instruction cache. Runs on most modern operating systems. You know, uh, because it's based on MMAP, it requires an OS that supports mapped memory and virtual memory. Uh, so while it actually can run in very small environments, you, you, can, you can practically use it with as little as 64 kilobytes of RAM, you actually do still need something like a kernel. So uh, it doesn't quite run on tiny IoT appliances all the time, but that is one of its limitations. Uh, it's, it supports both multi-process and multi-thread concurrency. The concurrency model is a single writer plus arbitrary number of readers. Okay, in, in most concurrency systems you'll see uh, Writers and readers are exclusive. If you have one writer, it blocks all the readers. But in LMDB, writers don't block readers, and readers don't, don't block writers. Also, uh, reads actually take no locks, and uh, nothing. there's no blocking calls in the read path. So nothing is there to slow it down. Reads scale perfectly linearly uh, across as many CPUs as you have. Um, the system has is guaranteed it will never deadlock. And again, along with uh, MVCC, uh, 
the locking semantics, if, if you're familiar with SQL and uh, different levels of locking isolation, this is fully serial, serializable isolation. So not only do we support transactions across arbitrary number of items, arbitrary number of databases, we also support nested transactions. So if you're doing um, a small group of related operations within a larger transaction, you can commit them or roll them backwards as a subunit inside a larger transaction. So the main approach inside the database is uh, using a copy on write technique. So whenever you're making a modification to the database, you never change live data. You, you always make a copy of the data you're interested in and work on the copy. And because we never alter data in place, that means even if the system crashes in the middle of an operation, um, the old data structure is always intact. And whatever you're working on in progress well, that disappears. But because of this, that means we don't need any write-ahead logs or transaction logging. Um, that means we don't have to do any maintenance of log files or cleanup on them. And uh, that means there is actually zero restart time. You know, when, when you shut down the machine and, and turn it back on again, the database is ready to use immediately. One of the fundamental concepts here is called single level store. It's been around since the 1960s. And the idea is that uh, all of the storage in your system is, uh, ref is reflected or represented in your system's memory. So when you're accessing a byte of memory, that's the same as accessing a byte of a disk. So because of this, uh, when, when our database returns a value to the application, uh, there's actually no memory allocation or memory copies involved. We just hand you a pointer back to a field in the mem map, and that's the same as the field on disk. Uh, optionally, we can do the same thing for writes, uh, but by default, we only do this for reads. So optionally, you can also write directly into the uh, memory map and have zero copy writes. And again, because we're using MMAP to do all of our data I.O., we don't actually maintain any kind of caching or buffering inside the LMDB library. Everything is based on the OS cache. One of the interesting things about this approach is uh, you can actually store live pointer-based objects in the database and use them directly without serializing or deserializing them. Okay. Now, this is easy to do in C. It's not so easy to do in just about any other language, but it is something that we take advantage of. So this is an example from an OpenLDAP configuration file um, where we came from using Berkeley database before and using LMDB now. Uh, in the Berkeley database, you had to configure multiple different caches, you had to configure a lock subsystem, you had to configure a log subsystem, and all of those things needed to be carefully tuned and allocated. Uh, so LMDB is much simpler. Now, we're coming at this from the perspective of LDAP. You know, LDAP is a read-heavy database, all right? It's, it's designed for workloads that are primarily read-oriented, maybe 80-20 or 90-10 even. And so our focus on LMDB is to make it a read-optimized database. And, uh, you know, it is the world's fastest for read workloads, right? In, in this chart, I'm showing you read performance for small records. Uh, they have 16-byte keys and 100-byte values. Um, and this is a database with 100 million records. And I'm comparing them with a couple of other well-known embedded databases. Uh, you've got Berkeley DB, uh, Google's LevelDB, uh, Kyoto Cabinet's TreeDB, and also SQLite 3. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, you can see that the, the difference in read speeds is, is pretty drastic. Now, if we go to larger objects, this is with 100,000 byte values. Um, I mean, the, the other databases don't even register, right? Uh, I'll give you the same data on a logarithmic scale, just so you see that they're not zero, but th they are actually doing some work. But the, I mean, the difference is multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, so this project has been around since 2011, and we've tested it on just about any hardware configuration you can imagine. You know, we've used uh, all of the file systems that Linux supports. Um, we've used you know, rotating hard drives, SSDs, uh, PCI-based uh, memory arrays. We've tested across multiple malloc libraries. You know, basically, any kind of hardware software configuration you'd run across We've benchmarked this, and all these uh, across various data sizes, virtual machine, physical machine, whatever, and all of these have been characterized. There's full reports on the LMDB website. Two, in, uh, two different independent university teams were analyzing uh, crash survivability of software systems, and. Uh, in both cases, LMDB was the only software package that came out with zero errors. So this, this has been analyzed quite in depth. The design is solid, the implementation follows the design, and it works. So how did we get here? Uh, the API is based on the Berkeley D and DB API. Um, that's something that OpenLDAP has been using since 2000 or 2001. So that's something we've had the most intimate famili familiarity with. Um, we stripped out a lot of things that Berkeley does that you know, we had no use for. Uh, the Berkeley database actually originated as a hash-based database, and they added B trees to it in a later version. Uh, we found in heavy testing on larger databases that uh, B trees just scale better to larger data volumes. You know, once once your data set is larger than your physical RAM, extensible hashing just you know, falls off a cliff. Yeah? When you say Berkeley database, you're just now Sleepy Cat, right? That was Sleepy Cat, and now it's Oracle, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and obviously, you know, we wanted to get rid of all of these features of Berkeley that were giving us headaches through the years as OpenLDAP administrators, you know, tuning the caches tuning the logs and locks and maintaining the logs. Um, over the years, you know, we were always running in people who said, hey, my transaction logs ate up my file system and you know, now the server's hung and all those sorts of things. So a lot of, a lot of what we designed into LMDB was just um, to avoid these headaches. So summarizing all that again. To get good, I mean, you could get good performance out of OpenLDAP's Berkeley database backend, but uh, it wasn't easy. You know, we, we had three levels of caching to deal with. Um, each layer of the cache has completely different performance characteristics. All right, first, the file system, the operating system, is always doing its own caching. All right, and then the Berkeley DB itself is doing uh, a block cache of its own, and then Open LDAP code had its own cache because the Berkeley cache wasn't fast enough. All right, so uh, at the operating system, you're dealing with you know, uh, pages of 4K or 8K. And in the database, you're dealing with uh, extents of whatever size your data values are. And then in Open LDAP, we're, uh, we're dealing in uh, objects, you know, logical objects. And so each of these things expands or contracts as they're going through the different layers. Um, so for you to predict how much RAM you actually need for a particular deployment was nearly impossible. And if, we, if you ever tried to disable any particular one of those caches, uh, the performance would just plummet. And the interesting thing about having multiple layers of caches is 
Well, that means we also need multiple layers of locking to make sure that the data is consistent when it moves from one layer to the next. Um, so in the normal process, in the normal progress of a bunch of operations going through Berkeley database, uh, you ran into deadlocks almost all the time. And that was just routine. It was just, this is a normal error code from the database. You back off and you retry. And that's just the way things are done. The other interesting thing about having multiple caches like this is they weren't actually even always useful, all right? There's, um, there's a standard problem when you're using any cache uh, with whatever algorithm it is, least e recently used or whatever. You know, uh, say you have a cache that, that's large enough for four items, and you do a search that's going to return six items, all right? Once your search has filled up the cache with the first four items, okay, the next item that tries to return and it wants to put it in the cache has to kick something else out, all right? So your items one, two, three, four are sitting there. Number five comes in, number one disappears. Number six comes in, number two disappears. If you repeat this search operation, that means the cache has zero usability because none of the items actually got reused. They all got kicked out before they could get reused. Okay, so this is a common problem in most caching systems. And at the same time, because you know, these caches at the user level are managed using malloc and free. Um, every time you put an entry in and remove an entry, you're fragmenting your heap. And in some of these malloc libraries, uh, heap fragmentation gets to be a huge problem. In particular in glibc, this, uh, this would kill a server over the course of days or weeks, where even if your workload hasn't changed, the server performance would just keep getting slower and slower because the heap was getting fragmented. Okay, so what did we learn? Cache management sucks. Let's not do that anymore. And lock, locks suck too. Let's not do those either. Um, and it turns out that if, when you switch to a concurrency method like multi-version concurrency control, you can actually get away with uh, not having most of those locks. The funny thing is that Berkeley DB actually does support MVCC, but um, it, you couldn't make a lot of good use of it because the rest of Berkeley DB is still so slow that you would still need to put your own cache in front of it. So we weren't really able to use it. And moving forward, uh, let's see, the, the next release of Berkeley, sorry, the next release of OpenLDAP, we're going to put the big deprecated label on all the Berkeley support, and that's 2.5. In 2.6, it'll be removed. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we're, we're dealing with a single level store, so we can service any data request by just returning a pointer to the data in a memory map. And our code doesn't have to do any kind of copy or allocation operations. Now, the interesting thing about this approach is there used to be a lot of databases on the market that worked this way back in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. And um, that only worked because the computers of that time had a much smaller data volume uh, memory, si uh, memory size than their 32-bit address space. But you know, over the course of time, we started seeing machines with 2 gig of RAM, 4 gig of RAM, and much larger data sets, and that approach kind of fell out of favor. Um, now that 64-bit PCs are fairly common, ubiquitous, uh, it's, it's much more practical again today. Um, now, the first releases of LMDB had this limitation. If you, if you build it on a 32-bit system, you can only use a database up to about two gig in size. Uh, the next release, we actually have an option to uh, un unmap and remap in segments so that we can actually window over a larger data file. But for a 64-bit system, you know, you're, you're currently limited to a 48-bit address space on an Intel processor. So that gets you 128 terabytes in one database. <laughs> 
the memory uh, that we use, we map it uh, read-only. Okay, so we don't actually perform writes through the map. And the reason we do this is uh, it, it lets you detect errors, right? If you accidentally try and modify a value that we return to you, you will get a segmentation fault and your code will crash. And this lets you find you know, programming errors very quickly. Right. Optionally, you can also set it to use a writable memory map. Um, and I would recommend you would not do this unless you know your code is already debugged. There's, there's a lot of uh, gotchas when you're using a writable memory map. You know, the main thing being uh, you modify a bunch of pages in memory and the operating system decides when it flushes them out. You, know, you, you don't have strict control over when those writes actually get to your stable storage. Uh, and if, you, if you're unlucky, you know, the OS will, will write out one page that says, oh, these writes have been done before the actual data got written out. And then the next time you open the database, it's completely corrupted. This is actually, uh, this is a personal email I had with Keith Bostick, who was one of the Berkeley DB authors. And he was explaining why they never took this approach with Ber Berkeley DB itself. Um, if you're familiar with MongoDB, anyone? Yeah, their, their old, their first version of their database used a writable memory map. And I'm quite sure that they were not careful enough because you would see their corruption reports frequently. So there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to use a memory map. And the safest way is not to write through it. Okay. So again, the importance here, uh, especially with the memory map data structure, is never modify data in place because you don't have control over when that modification hits stable storage. Right? Always work on a copy. And as long as you're working on a copy, you can never break the data that's already on disk. And since you can guarantee that you're never going to break things, that means you don't need a log file anymore. So you don't have to manage log files, worry about the space they're using, you know, rotate them, whatever. They don't exist. And in a read transaction, the reader is always completely isolated from writes. You know, they can never see a, a partially in-progress modification. Of course, um, if you actually set out to build a fully multi-version system, uh, you'll find it's very resource intensive. All right, uh, that, means, that means you're keeping track of every change that's ever been in, in the database from the beginning of time. And that'll eat up all your disk. Uh, if you don't want it to eat up all of your disk, that means you need to run some kind of a background task to prune old records. And you probably don't even know how to schedule that, how frequently to schedule that, how much you need to remove on every pruning pass. So that adds complexity. The other problem with that is uh, if your server is running at its peak speed for accepting user rights, okay, then if you're going to have enough bandwidth to do a background pruning job, you know, that either means you've got to over-provision the server because suddenly you're going to have an, another large uh, write consumer as you do the pruning, or when the pruning starts, all of your user writes are going to slow down. Okay. So having a background compaction job or pruning job is a terrible idea if you need to deliver fixed performance with a fixed set of hardware. In LMDB, we really only maintain two versions of the database. There's, there's a page zero and a page one, and we just ping pong between them as you write new transactions. Uh, I mean, in general, going, going back to an older version just isn't interesting, right? We want to see current data, the latest and most recent data. And we only keep the previous version uh, as a means of keeping the structure consistent 
I mean, you can fall back to that if you need to, but in general, nobody wants to see the old data. We also maintain uh, in a separate B tree a, a complete list of all of the unused pages. So uh, whenever we're allocating space for a new operation, we can reuse old free pages in preference to allocating more space from, from the OS. And all of this state management is done without any locks. There's no wait states in there. So the evolution of this code is interesting because it, it starts from a B-tree library that was written for OpenBSD. Um, and uh, I mean, I find this humorous because you know, they wrote this uh, because they weren't happy with OpenLDAP code. So, so okay, well, I'll take your tree because maybe it's a good one. It turned out to be a good one. Uh, it did a few things that we didn't need, so we removed those. Um, and it also operated in a strange mode called append only. Uh, how many of you have used Couchbase, CouchDB? Yeah, so Couchbase uses an append only database as well. And the interesting thing about that is, um, so it is copy on write, so it's completely reliable, but uh, it eats up disk space like crazy. You know, uh, when I was testing in append only mode, uh, within about 10 operations, you know, my database was hundreds of megabytes in size, and 99% of the space was old. You know, it was for obsolete versions of the records. So it's, it's a horribly inefficient way to store data, although it is very secure, very safe. And uh, so that first version of LMDB, which released in 2011, was actually smaller than 32 kilobytes. And Berkeley, T, uh, Berkeley DB today is still, you know, one or two megabytes in size. Just as a comparison of other common embedded databases now, um, the top line there, DB Bench, is actually Google Level DB, the original Level DB. And the second one is uh, Basho Level DB, which was forked off for the RIAC project. Uh, they were trying to control the impact of background compaction on their throughput. Then there's Berkeley DB. Uh, and then Hyper Level DB, which was another fork of Google's Level DB that tried to do better parallelism for uh, reads and writes. So MDB was uh, the original name of LMDB. Then there's Rocks DB, which was a fork from Facebook where they started with Level DB and just tried to improve its performance. Now, Facebook says that RocksDB is written specifically for use on uh, SSDs, you know, um, direct access storage. Uh, TokyoDB is um, a database based on the idea of fractal trees. Uh, it, it's also modeled on the Berkeley DB interface, so it, it has some uh, it has some interesting ideas in common with Berkeley and in common with LMDB. And then the last one there is Wired Tiger. And Wired Tiger, uh, the guys who started Wired Tiger are the same guys who founded Sleepy Cat. So they, they went from the Sleepy Cat to the caffeine hyped up Wired Tiger. Um, and so again, it has a lot of the similar ideas. Uh, and it's also fully transactional. But as you can see, um, you know, with MDB at like less than 8,000 lines of code, there, there's quite a, quite a big difference in footprint across these code bases. All right, um, if you'd like to find out more about how LMDB works, there's hours and hours of video on the internals. I'm not gonna hit you with that today. So when would you use something like this? Uh, it's probably a good idea if you have a very read-heavy workload, right? It's probably a good idea if you can't withstand uh, a crash, a corruption crash. Now, in a lot of cases, 
with uh, cloud services, you don't actually care about this. If your data is replicated across you know, 100 nodes and you lose one of them, you may not even notice. Right? So it really depends on the type of hardware you're using, the scale of hardware you're using. You know, if you've only got your data spread across two or three machines, it's probably more important to you that it comes back intact from a crash. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of code out there that doesn't use transactions, right? Which is fine if you only have one task accessing the data, right? If you don't have to deal with concurrency, you don't have to deal with um, operations to multiple records at the same time, that sort of thing, you can get away without using transactions. I, I would say most of the software we see today, though, is, is fairly complex now. You know, you update one record but that also means you have to update six indexes to correspond to that record, right? And so any time you get into the case that you need to touch multiple places because of one operation, you really need transaction support. In a lot of the benchmarks, you'll see the other databases are much faster when you have lots of very small records, all right? So, um, the performance advantage for write operations switches towards LMDB as the record sizes get larger, say above 2K or 4K. Obviously, you need an OS that supports virtual memory. So if you're running in, in a little uh, embedded device, it may not help you. In a lot of cases, uh, if you have a lot of command line tools that you want to work on the same database, so you need multi-process concurrency, uh, you won't have a lot of choices. You know, level DB and all of its derivatives are single process only. Um, Berkeley DB is multi-process, and a couple of the others are, but the majority of databases out there that have been written in the past five or ten years are all single process. At this point, um, all of this code has been packaged and distributed across pretty much any Linux OS you can find. Uh, it's, it's on FreeBSD, Mac OS. Um, in OpenLDAP, you know, we've had some great results with it. Uh, performance is up, memory use is down. Um, and in other applications that have adapted it, uh, you, you see similar results. Here again, um, a bunch of different databases compared using, again, 100 million records, 16 byte keys, 100 byte values. Uh, this, this graph is just the time it takes to load that much data into the database. All right? And that's feeding it in in sequential order, which is the best case. And you can see, I mean, you know, Berkeley DB there is taking the most time. So for the OpenLDAP project, the switch from Berkeley to LMDB was, was a huge win for just sysadmin throughput. Now on that data set, we have uh, a single thread writing as fast as it can, and then an increasing number of reader threads, so 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 readers. And so what this chart is showing you is the speed of the writer as the number of reads increase. And here is the other half of that chart. This is the number of read operations we're getting uh, with that single writer doing its best. There's two, uh, two sets of numbers there for RocksDB. There's one with its default configuration, and there's one with a heavily tuned configuration. Now, the heavily tuned configuration is doing very well, all right? That requires you to configure 40 different parameters, all right, and out of, out of a set of God knows, 60, 80 possible choices. Um, and I did not tune this myself. I, I got that tuning from the Facebook engineers. All right? There's no way I would have arrived at that myself. So, I mean, Facebook's RocksDB, it is possible to get very good performance out of it. But it's unlikely that you'll get it by yourself. Okay. So here's another set. Um, 
using a much larger data set. Uh, the database is 160 gigabytes, and the machine only has 32 gigs of RAM. So we're talking about you know, five times memory size. And again, this, this is the time it takes to just to load the data in. And this is the same you know, 1 to 64 writer reader performance test. And here again, here's the read performance for that same test. This is a similar test, but uh, we're varying the size of the data values. So this is now with a 4,000 byte value. The, the wired tiger code was extremely fast, but uh, at this speed, it's, uh, it needs to use background compaction. And at, at this speed, its background compaction thread didn't get to run. So it ate up the, all the free space on the disk and then crashed. And again, the reads at that uh, scale level. So here's uh, Memcache. How many of you have used Memcache in your systems? OK. So there's, there's a fork of Memcache called Memcache DB. It was written using Berkeley DB. Uh, and I've adapted it to use LMDB instead. So the idea is um, you now have a cache that survives a reboot, all right? You have a persistent cache. And the interesting thing is um, memcache with LMDB is faster than memcache with RAM when you have more than one thread. And the reason for that is with LMDB, readers take no locks with memcache, and it's in-memory data structure, they still take locks. And so as your number of threads concurrency increases, memcache with RAM slows down. LMDB doesn't. All right, so the previous thread, that's a sing uh, sorry, this slide is a single thread, and this slide is using four threads. If we keep on increasing the number of threads, um, you'll see the performance gap between LMDB and memcache just widen. And also, just for comparison there, uh, you know, InnoDB is the main data engine used in MySQL, right? And in the recent releases of MySQL, they provide a memcache interface to InnoDB. And this just shows you that th there's really, I can't think of any reason you'd ever use that thing, but there it is. At a certain point, you're going to start detecting a trend in these slides, right? Uh, the, the top slide there is the time it takes to load this data set, which is, again, five times larger than RAM. Um, sorry, this one is 50 times larger than RAM. And that's comparing LMDB to level DB. And the other thing to, to get out of these slides is not only is the performance higher, the actual latency is more consistent, all right? If, if you look at level DB's latency, there, it's, it's very spiky. If you look at L, uh, LMDB, it's pretty much a flat line. And the spread across you know, percentiles is much tighter. So the previous slide was just loading the data. This is now running a concurrent uh, read and write workload. Again, just looking at the map of latency across percentiles. Interesting case study. This, I mean, I, I put this in here because I think this interview was done in, here in Dublin. Um, so the Armory is a Bitcoin wallet. How many of you are into crypto coins at all? All right, so you've, you've probably seen this. Uh, they, they, their previous version of their wallet took three days to sync with the blockchain, and after they switched to LMDB, they could do it in two hours. Just one more set of graphs here. These are LDAP directory servers. They're all of the common ones on the market today. Um, and just, you know, the, the version in OpenLDAP 2.4 is the second column. 
The version we're just about to release in 2.5 is the leftmost column. This shows uh, the speeds for a pure search job, a pure modified job, and then a mixed search and modified job. You can see that, uh, for example, that column there marked other number two. In a pure read-only workload, it actually performs very well. But once you start throwing writes into the mix, it bottlenecks because it's doing readers exclusive to writers. We've got tons and tons of these benchmarks. So if you're interested in how databases work, designing your own, you know, these, these are some important lessons. Uh, pretty much every database vendor out there now is using MVCC. You know, this is the right way to go. Uh, but if you combine that with a memory map, it's, it's far more powerful. Um, so the current version is called LMDB 0 0.9. It's actually very stable. Uh, it's, yeah, it, we're, we've seen that there's some features that we would be nice to have that we're adding in 1.0. Uh, this is a major version bump because the disk format will change. It'll be completely incompatible. At the API level, it'll be much the same, but on disk it'll be different. So bringing this home for you guys, I mean, all of this is written in C. I'm a C programmer. I'm not a Python programmer, and you're going to know that as soon as you see the next couple slides. <laughs> all right, so this is just an extract of the relevant snippets, all right. Um, in LMDB, the first thing you do is you create an environment object, all right? So that's env LMDB open, so you give it a path to where you're storing the database, and you have to tell it a maximum size of the database, all right? This is gonna set the size of the memory map that we use. A lot of people worry about this, it's like, well, how do I, how do I know what, what the biggest size should be? It's like, well, make it the size of your partition, of the disk that you're storing it on. That's it. You know, there's, that's as big as it can get, so just leave it there. You know, it's, it's, only, it's only virtual address space. It's not costing you anything, so make it as big as you can, and then don't think about it anymore. All right, so you create the environment, and then uh, you have to create a transaction to oper if you actually want to do an operation. And then within that operation, you can do a get or a put, and there's, there's some other options uh, to the put way too many options to go into right now. So in a transaction, you can do a get. And also, uh, transactions default to read only. If you want to be able to write inside this transaction, you have to actually say, give me a write transaction. Set write equals true. Now this, this is actually working code from, from an e-commerce site that I set up a little while ago. So please don't crash my website. <laughs> um, all right, so importing a bunch of basics to, to get things initialized, connecting to some server. This, this script is a backend that, that handles an instant payment notification from our payment processor. Right? So we get a transaction in, and we check it within our own database to see, you know, First, is it valid? Can we verify it? And then once we validated it, it's like, have we seen this one before? And that's where we record this in LMDB and say, hey, here's the transaction IDs I've already processed. And if I, if I haven't processed it yet, I start processing it and I send an email out to the customer saying, okay, we got it and we processed you. Everything's on its way. But it's always possible for the payment processor to send us the same thing two or three times, so we check and make sure that the transaction's unique. And that's pretty much it. And if something goes wrong, well, we tell them it's invalid. 